So I'd like to preface this post by stating that I'm a highly educated and scientific person and have never been a, a believer in the supernatural, Bigfoot, or things of that nature. That being said, I really am at a loss for the things my family has encountered on my property over the last seven years and would love to hear your suggestions. Seven years ago, my wife and I purchased a property and 11 acres of woods in a rural part of northeastern Minnesota. The woods were connected to a larger acreage of fields and woods of about maybe 160 acres, and although sparsely populated, the land is near a fairly busy state highway. There are some housing developments in the area, but they are like three to four miles away, and the majority of the land all around our property is farm fields, woods, and rivers. It's remote, but with town so close, I wouldn't call it wild by any means. I'm mentioning this too because I've heard many Native American legends of things in the deep northern woods of Minnesota and Canada, but the area in which we live is just not that. Rural, yes, but not the endless north woods. As I said earlier, I'm not a believer in the supernatural and have never been afraid of the woods or the outdoors, even though I have a healthy sense of caution and respect for large bears, moose, wolves, or other potentially dangerous wildlife. I'm also an avid hunter and mountaineer, and have experienced many nights in the wilderness. I've had numerous encounters with dangerous animals or situations, so I'm not spooked easily. And knowing my state of mind is important to my story because many so-called supernatural encounters can be explained by people with an already high level of uh, belief, anxiety, or fear. But that is just not me. Well, that all changed after the first few weeks of moving in, though. The house and the land had been abandoned for a couple of years due to foreclosure, so a lot of work needed to be done to get it back into shape. Wildlife had grown accustomed to no human presence, and Black Bear frequently roamed the yard at night along with many other woodland creatures. We also found a lot of animal bones scattered throughout the woods and coyotes were abundant. One night, in fact, during those first few weeks, we had a rainstorm and I was worried about a broken downspout potentially causing a basement leak. It was about 10pm so I grabbed my headlamp and headed outside to deal with the situation. Behind our house is a fairly large swampy area that divides the woods. I had my back facing this area while fiddling with the downspout when suddenly I just had this intense feeling of like dread. It's really hard to explain the feeling but it was like my body knew something was back there. It was very unusual based on the circumstances and never having felt this type of fear before too, I tried to stay calm and slowly turned around to point my headlamp back towards the swamp. And what I saw was something that I still can't explain. Eyes. Numerous glowing reflecting eyes staring back at me. These were not eye reflections that you typically see with a deer or other animals since they were different at heights and when I pointed my headlamp spot beam directly at where you would expect a head to be, there was nothing but weeds and trees. But when I turned the headlamp off, they were still there though, and glowing, as if a light was being shined. They didn't move, they just stared through me. Needless to say, I bolted and I ran as fast as I could back into the house and explained it away as a deer or raccoons. Later that summer, I was sitting out on a screened-in porch that partially faces the swamp and connected woods to the west. It was approximately 11pm when I began to hear what sounded like a bear fighting with or attacking a cow. Since there was a small farm to the southeast of my property, I assumed that perhaps a cow had wandered into the woods and been attacked by a bear or something. I really didn't know if this was something a bear would actually do, but it was my only guess based on the sounds I was hearing at the time. It was clearly some kind of a roar like a bear, but then followed by a frantic sounding cow's mooing. This went on for over an hour, and it was perhaps one of the most horrible sounds I've ever heard. Even though it sounded so strange, and I hate to say it, but almost supernatural, it didn't frighten me since I had this rational explanation in my head. Even weirder, this same series of sounds happened again the next summer. These first few years, I never really investigated the area of the woods the sounds came from since it just wasn't my property. 
But a couple of years later, I had the chance to purchase this area and 70 acres to the west, which consisted of the woods that connected to the mine, as well as a few tiled fields, more woods and ponds and stuff like that. As part of purchasing this land, I spent a great deal of time walking around on it to get a good understanding of its value and layout. As part of my walk, I was able to get a much better look at the farm set up to the south. The farm did have cows, as I suspected, but to my surprise, the area that they were kept in was a long distance from my house. In fact, much too far for me to hear them, and the fencing was also extremely well built and electrified. Looking at it now, there was just no way a cow was wandering off from that farm. I didn't really think about this fact until recently, but I feel it's the best way to lay everything out in a chronological order. You see, after acquiring the property, I proceeded to put up tree stands at the various locations along with trail cameras in order to prep for the upcoming deer hunting season. One spot was the hilly woods where I heard those sounds many years prior. Again, I didn't connect these two things until now, but the area was very odd as whenever I hiked through there, I always saw some new strange thing, I guess you could say. One time, my son and I found an old game snare tied to a tree with what looked to be dried blood on the bark. Another time, we found at least a hundred-year-old tree with a barbed wire fence completely spiraling the entire trunk, growing in it and out of it at different intervals. I've also found many tree trunks with very large scratches or claw marks, not resembling an antler rub. Maybe a bear, I guess? We'd almost always find dead animal bones in this area, and even this winter I found a couple of deer legs snapped and picked clean. My sons have found numerous animal skulls there as well. As I was saying, I put a game camera in this area too, since I'd seen tracks and signs and wanted to get a sense of the best places to hunt. I've placed one there many seasons, and to this day, I've yet to capture a single thing on it. Nothing. But my son has posted there a couple of times for hunting season, and has mentioned the strange sense of quiet that he gets there. He's used to the forest sounds coming back after sitting still for long periods of time, but in this spot, there are never any sounds. But what he has mentioned is hearing something walking around through there, though. Another incident occurred one hunting season when I was entering this area en route to another stand when I saw a violent thrashing in the foliage moving fast and crossing from right to left but moving away from my position. I, of course, encountered deer and bear all the time, so I'm familiar with how they move when spooked, but this, this was something different. But whatever this thing was made up a high-pitched trumpeting combined with bellowing sound that was like nothing I'd ever heard from an animal outside of a, maybe an elk, which we don't have in this area. It wasn't bounding, and there wasn't the raised white tail or large dark mass to indicate a deer or a bear. There really didn't appear to be a body at all, in fact. Just whipping and falling leaves and branches, along with the deafening sounds. A year after this incident, too, my son went out hiking in the woods to try and find me since I was out doing some forest management. As he walked through this area, he thought that he spotted me coming through the woods fast, but quickly noticed the walk and the clothing were nothing like mine. Whoever it was also was a lot taller than me, and he described him as extremely thin. He said the person that he saw did not notice him at all and seemed to be walking in a straight line like they had a tunnel vision or something. Seeing someone in this part of the woods and their direction of travel really didn't make much sense at all too since really would be no reason to be there or to be headed that way as it leads to deep ravines and an uncrossable river. After he found me though and explained what he saw, I quickly went over to investigate to see if we had a trespasser. I hiked for quite a while but I never found anything or anyone. If someone was there they either got picked up on the road or they completely vanished. That same year, my son had a friend over too, and they went for a late afternoon walk in the woods at one point. As it began to get dark, they made their way back by walking on the edge of the field that is next to this area of the woods. As they passed by, they said that they saw a figure a little ways off in the trees. But whatever they saw was near one of the hills in this patch of forest, and seemed to be making some kind of a hand gesture. 
It began walking slowly towards them when they called out hey and hello. He or it stopped still and said nothing. It was at this point that the boys sensed something just wasn't right and they bolted back towards the house. They rushed into the house and told me what they saw and I of course laughed it off as their mind playing tricks on them. My son described the figure as very tall, like 10 to 15 feet, but with skinny arms and his body was dark all over. And not hairy per se, but dark. They even thought that it was an animal at first because of the weird way it looked. He couldn't really describe it very well other than gaunt or skinny and strangely dark. Me being the curious and protective father I am, was worried about it being trespassers, drug addicts or both, so I told them that I would go and take a look. They brought me to the area and pointed to where it was standing and I headed into the woods. Since it was winter and there was snow on the ground, I thought that it would be easy to locate the tracks of whatever this was and find out where it came from or went. But when I got to the spot though, there wasn't a, a single track or disturbance in the snow. But what I mean is that there was no way that an animal or a man could have been in that area and not left tracks. Which means that they'd either made it up or their minds had played tricks on them. Or so I thought... But to this day, my son and his friends still swear that they saw it, clear as day, and I can definitely attest that their fright was real. But my wife also has experienced strange thrashing sounds and other feelings of dread or being watched in those parts of the woods and generally just refuses to go over there anymore. And all of this brings me to today where I had a sudden realization that all of the strange sounds, sightings, bones, and events seem to be centered around this area and I'm just at a complete loss to what it all means. It's still too strange to really bring this up and discuss it with people that I know anyway but I wanted to share my story and see if anyone in this particular community might have any theories or ideas on what we might be dealing with here. I'll continue to investigate on my end but would love to see what all of you guys think. Anyway, thanks for listening and for any insight that you might be able to share. So, to preface this story, I was a 21-year-old male, 6'2", 240 pounds. Not a small or weak-looking guy by any means. And I was wanting to lose some weight for a while at this point and had been going on walks for a bit sometimes during the evening or very late at night even. It was Florida and it gets hot unless it's night time. Plus, like I said, I'm a pretty big dude, so I don't really have anything to worry about. Or so I thought. But one night though, I decided to go out walking around my neighborhood around 3 in the morning in like a big puffy jacket and black pants. I felt like in this situation that I would be the creepy person that someone would be scared of. My walk was going good as usual and was actually getting close to the end of it. But then this old school sort of wood panel passes by and goes into a driveway somewhat in front of me. I barely think anything of it. Always three or six cars go by on one of these late night excursions anyway. But it's what happens next that is what unsettled me. This van pulls back out of the driveway with its lights off. After I pass by the driveway, mind you. Luckily, I wasn't listening to any music or else I probably wouldn't have heard it. The van then proceeds to pull out and drive towards me and stops right in front of me. At this point, I know that I don't want to end up like some kind of horror movie character. So, I book it in the opposite direction I go down an off-branching street and keep going down these random streets to give me as much time as possible. I end up hiding in some random bushes in someone's yard and stay there for a little bit. I wanted to text my mum, but I was scared and didn't want the light from my phone to give me away. So I watch for any sign of them. Nothing for five minutes. Just as you think the coast is clear, there they are again. I hear a car coming down the street and it's those same guys, but with their lights on this time. I'm pretty hidden in these bushes right against someone's house, so they just go by, thankfully, but my heart is beating so quickly and I'm terrified at this moment. 
I wait a little bit more until I truly believe the coast is clear and get back to my house as quickly as I can. I wake up my mum and we call the cops and I give them as much info as possible. They said that they would patrol the neighbourhood and after that I, I don't hear anything more. I just can't help thinking about that event though and what their motives were. I always try to debunk stuff like that but all their actions pointed to wanting to do something to me. But what did they want to do? I'm not a pretty young lady by any means. I'm pretty large actually. Menacing sort of looking. My neighborhood is not even nice enough to rob. A very just sort of like middle class I would guess. And I mean what am I going to have on me while walking at like 2am? So I just can't help but think that maybe they didn't want to kidnap me or mug me but maybe maybe they wanted to kill me. It freaks me out to this day. I started working part-time at a local gas station convenience store over the summer of 2016 to earn some extra money while attending college. When I was hired, I was informed that female employees were never scheduled to work overnight shifts, for obvious safety reasons, which I was relieved to hear. I wasn't so much worried about my safety, but I was concerned about getting enough sleep before classes. It wasn't long before I found myself dreading the days that I had to work though, as the job turned out to be much more difficult than I had anticipated. But we were always short-staffed, which forced us to constantly multitask between running cash registers, preparing food, keeping eyes on pumps, cleaning, stocking, etc. But to make matters worse, the two women who managed the place were awful in every way, and I frequently found myself biting my tongue and talking myself out of quitting. I was especially on edge when they cut our 15 minute break down to 10 minutes, as I never seemed to have enough time to use the restroom and smoke a cigarette fast enough. But it wasn't until several annoying encounters with a regular, James, that I finally started to break. James was younger than me, maybe late teens or early 20s, and he thought that he owned the place. Perhaps being the grandson of one of the managers gave him a sense of entitlement to mess with people there. But the first time that I met James, he approached the counter to purchase some chewing tobacco. As I was ringing him up, I asked to see his ID and he told me who he was related to. But I politely asked again to see his ID because I was new. Another employee overheard our conversation and assured me that he was old enough, so I went ahead and rang him up. Staring at me intently the whole time, he looked down at my name tag and said, Mindy, that's a pretty name. I thanked him for the compliment and gave him his dip, but he continued talking to me and asking several personal questions. He wanted to know where I lived, what my last name was, whether or not I had a boyfriend, etc. Meanwhile, a long line had formed behind him and not trying to be rude, I said something like, Sorry, there's a line behind you, and I casually mentioned for the next customer to move up. But James didn't leave. He simply stepped to the side and continued talking to me and watching me as I rang each customer up. It was immediately uncomfortable and unsettling for me, but I did my best to pretend like I wasn't bothered. Even when his persistence escalated and another co-worker told him to leave me alone. James soon began to make more appearances after that too, the second time being with his girlfriend and another male friend by his side. Yeah, he had a girlfriend and I was really confused when he started flirting with me again, this time right in front of her, but oddly enough she didn't say a word. So I brushed it off and played along assuming that he's just the goof that my co-worker said that he was. But when he sat in a booth with his sidekicks at the back of the store, I could feel his eyes burning a hole right through me. Over time, I grew more suspicious of James, as I would witness him do and say countless things to hurt others. I knew that he was annoying and I had learned to brush that off as an all in good and fun sort of type of humor like everyone else did. But when I caught him making fun of another co-worker to her face, all I could feel was anger toward him. 
I removed her from the situation by taking her place at the register as I could tell that she was very hurt and embarrassed by his comments. And by doing so, it was apparent to James that I didn't approve. He would continue to cruelly harass this poor girl and even some of the customers who came in, but trying to make him stop was like scolding a child. I didn't lash out at him though. At this point, I just began to ignore him. James then started playing these head games with me while I was working. He would take soda and candy, walk outside without paying for it, and then come back into the store and say that I forgot to ring it up loud enough for everyone to hear. One night, he even filled up his gas tank and took off without paying for it, before returning to say that he forgot to pay. He knew that he'd always get away with it because Granny was the manager. By this point, it wouldn't have surprised me if he really was stealing gas and food from the store, though. There was just something very dark and strange lurking behind his goofball facade, and I avoided him like the plague, though it was nearly impossible to do at times. But then, one day, while I was working alone with another co-worker, we were very busy with tasks as usual, when, lo and behold, James walked in by himself, I muttered under my breath, a pain in the butt, and I walked straight back into the freezer to finish what I was working on earlier. But then, he followed me, inside the freezer. To be honest too, I really didn't know that he was there until he walked up right behind me and asked why I didn't greet him anymore. Startled, I sort of jumped and quickly turned around, grabbing my chest and asking him what the heck he was doing back here. He laughed as I told him I was busy and reminded him that only employees could be in this area. He ignored everything that I said and instead proceeded to ask me personal questions, just like he did the first day that I met him. You never told me where you live, he said. I'm curious about you and I just want to know. Tell me where you live. He was moving closer and closer toward me, literally backing me into the corner of the freezer. Are you afraid of me, Mindy? He asked. I tried to push past him, telling him to move, but he kept stepping in front of me to block my way out. Not until you answer me, he said. I started calling out for my co-worker who showed up and gave him a heck of a talking to for being in the freezer. I was finally able to push past James and I made my way to the front counter where I looked at the clock and saw that it was time for me to go home. I gathered my things and punched out as quickly as I could, but James followed me out of the parking lot. I swiftly got into my car, but James managed to grab the top of the door before I was able to shut it. Come on, just let me see your ID, he persisted. I repeatedly told him no before I found myself practically begging for him to let go of my door so that I could go home. Then he grinned at me and said, don't make me follow you, Mindy. Chills ran down my spine at that point. Knowing how bold of a person he was and considering the fact that he literally just cornered me in the freezer only minutes ago, I highly expected him to follow through with that. Threatened by visions of what my drive home might look like, I became angry at this point. I looked at him dead on before shouting, let go of my door and stay away from me. I then grabbed the door handle and ripped the door shut as hard as I could. He tried yanking on the door handle from the outside to open it, but luckily uh, I locked the door just in time. He then continued to knock on my window asking to see my ID, but I started my car and backed away from him. I turned the wheels and hightailed it out of there while he just stood and watched me speed off. I was never so glad to finally get away from him, but I was paranoid the whole way home, thinking that he could possibly catch up to me on the road even though I, I never saw his vehicle behind me. I would end up quitting the job after this, and I didn't care that my hiring manager was angry about it. I had enough of everything, and dealing with James was the last straw. I didn't bother explaining anything to my manager because it was apparent to me that James was probably never held accountable for anything that he ever did wrong in his life, and he likely never would be. I never saw him again after that, and... I hope I never do either. James was a jerk, a clown, a joker. But he was also clearly borderline psychotic.
Recently, I had to make a quick run to Walmart after work for a few smaller items that I'd forgotten the day before. About halfway into my trip, I was approached by a woman and a young girl who asked me to buy a pack of diapers for them. Now, I do enjoy helping people whenever I can, but something felt incredibly off-putting about this situation. Something about the way that she strode right up to me and just asked. It felt very rehearsed, I think. I told her no in the most polite way that I could muster, and she nodded and went on. I was prepared to deal with potentially having turned away a woman who genuinely needed help, but like I mentioned, something just felt very wrong about it. I completed the rest of my shopping and was well on my way to forgetting the encounter, but when I made my way up to the self-checkout, suddenly the same lady and the little girl made a beeline for me. She doesn't look to me or speak to me or anything, and she and the girl just start scanning not only the diapers, but items that they had hidden in their clothes, racking up a huge total in the self-checkout. Completely stupefied that she just brazenly assumed that I would pay for it all, I got the attention of the associates and quietly explained the situation, making it clear that I wasn't trying to make a scene, but I simply didn't know these people and I wasn't about to pay for their belongings now that I knew that it was a ploy. He told me that they had apparently had to deal with her before, and I wasn't the first customer that she had a run-in with. He put on his most patient customer service voice and talked to the woman, at which point she pretended not to speak English, despite having had a pretty firm grasp on it earlier when asking me to buy diapers for them. She just kept pointing at me as if to indicate that she and the girl were with me, Thankfully, she wasn't fooling the associate, who by now had not only cleared her items from my checkout, but had placed himself between myself and the woman, still pretending that she couldn't understand him and still adamant that we were together. She was getting louder now, and things were escalating too, so I made a point to pay for my belongings, and I just hightailed it straight out of there. I hurried out to the car, closing the door just in time to see the little girl sprinting to catch up with me, the woman not far behind her. Panic set in and suddenly I was trying to lock the doors quickly, throwing my groceries in and buckling up all at once. She was frantically tapping at my window as I cranked the car with what I assumed at first was her nails. I wasn't going to look until I caught the sun gleaming off of something. I turned to find that she wasn't tapping with her nails, but instead with the tip of a switchblade. She was also making slow, deliberate slicing motions with it. Just about the only thing that I could think to do at that point was throw my car into reverse and get out of there as quickly as I could. And as I did, she and the girl slowly walked in front of my car, heading back towards the store. As she was walking by, the woman turned and looked at me and gave what I could only describe as the most sinister smile that I've ever seen. Something was just so deeply insidious about the way that she gave me that knowing look. A truly diabolical version of the kind of look a mischievous kid gives you when they know that they're doing something that they're not supposed to. I was shaken, but ultimately I was okay. Though I would be lying if I said that I didn't look over my shoulder for a long while. So it was a summer night, I was around 8 or 9 years old, a group of 6 kids, we were playing manhunt, kind of like hide and seek I guess, in our neighbourhood. The street that we played on was a dead end with a baseball field at the end. The field was undergoing construction at the time so there were sort of big construction vehicles parked and big mounds of dirt and stuff like that around. We were hiding and attempting to cross the field without getting caught by the opposing team. As we made our way across the field, a white truck flashed its lights at us. We were startled because we didn't think that there was anyone in the truck, and one of my friends started to run. I froze up and noticed two old men in the truck. The driver laughed at us as he rolled down the window and said, It's too late for little girls to be out alone like this. He really creeped me out too. He had a thick moustache, wore big thick glasses and a baseball cap. And at that, we booked it out of there, and I don't remember much else from that night, other than the fact that one of my friends was so scared that she literally wet herself. 
But later on that week, one of my friends from that night and I, we were on one of our afternoon walks around town. As we walked by the town hall though, something just pulled me to take a closer look at one of the notices taped up onto the window. And it was a sex offender listing for the creepy driver of that white truck. And even at that young age, my friend and I, we were aware of how dire a situation that we could have been in that night. We are so lucky. I still think about this encounter even as an adult because it was a weird one. So when I was about 10, I'm 25 now, I was downstairs watching TV late at night with my mum and sisters. Everyone decided to head off to bed and I was left alone downstairs just watching TV. I started drifting off at some point and all of a sudden someone started banging on our door really hard. I'm talking let me in hard. I was so scared that I just sort of sat there frozen staring at the door like my life depended on it. My dog was laying right next to me and also just stared. He never barked or moved an inch which was odd too because he always barked at the door. The banging never stopped for what seemed like a solid five minutes but it was probably more like maybe a minute when I think back on it. In any case, I looked at my dog, and I think because I finally moved, my dog snapped out of his trance, looked back at me for a split second, and jumped up and ran towards the door. He still didn't bark, but instead started turning his head like he was confused. I finally got the courage to get up and open the blinds to see what was going on. And this young woman, maybe around 20, 25, was standing there holding her left breast in her hand. It was still attached to her, but she was pretty large-breasted and she was holding it trying to keep them up from sagging, I'm guessing? I don't know. Like I said, it was weird. But she had blonde hair, white skin, and was just covered in blood. Her shirt was ripped and her hair was a mess. I remember thinking that she may have gotten beat up or was in a car crash or something. Either way, I immediately went to go and open the door. But as soon as I went to unlock it... My mum, out of nowhere, slammed her hand on the door and relocked it. I had no idea that she'd even come downstairs at this point, let alone walked up behind me. I was so focused on the door and on this woman, I think, that when she slammed her hand, it was almost as if it knocked me back into reality. Reality of not opening the door for strangers in the middle of the night. I looked up at her and I could feel my eyes were wide and I think I even started crying. She put her hand on my shoulder though and moved me away from the door. She yelled, who is it, through the door and the girl yelled back that her boyfriend had beat her up and that they lived in the apartment across the street from us. Mind you, we lived in a townhouse in a cul-de-sac. Our unit was all the way in the back where you would start the turn. What I mean is that we were the first unit in the row but where she pointed out her and her boyfriend's place was at was quite a ways away from us. Anyway, my mum asked her her name and she said something that sounded like something any, maybe Bethany or Stephanie or something. I saw my mum hesitate to open the door, but after she yelled, please help me, my mum opened the door, stepped out and pulled it close to being shut, but not completely shut. I cracked the door behind her to make sure that she was okay and also see what was going on. The woman, that I guess we'll call Bethany from now on, kept thanking my mum and asking to come in because she was scared that her boyfriend was going to come after her. My mum refused and explained that she couldn't let her in because of the safety of her four kids but said that she would sit out with her. My mum then yelled at me to grab the phone and call the police, so I did. My mum started asking her what happened and what specific unit that she lived in. She pointed towards her specific one and told my mom the building number and her unit, whatever it was, when this silver SUV pulled up a little later and she ran towards it yelling, that's my sister, and then just jumped in. The car sped off without another word from her or even a single word from the sister. My mom looked back at me confused and came back inside and shut and locked the door. We just sort of stood there and... I think we just sort of looked at each other for a bit. 
I asked my mum eventually what about the police and she said that she would wait for them downstairs if I wanted to go to bed. I was too scared to leave her though so I ended up just waiting with her. Once they arrived my mum explained what happened and the officer said that she did the right thing not letting her inside. The weird thing though is that like I said my dog never barked once until the cops knocked on the door that is. They also explained that they've been receiving similar calls like that in the area recently, so this was not the only event like this. Even worse though, the next morning we all packed up to go to the grocery store and as we passed that building, you could definitely tell that that apartment that she allegedly lived in was completely empty. Like, no one had been living in it. Maybe they... Just didn't have any furniture or anything, but I don't know. It was definitely fishy. Whatever happened that night, the alleged boyfriend never came after her that night, and we never saw her or the SUV ever again either. I hope that she is okay if it was real, but also, if it's not, well, don't ever knock on my door again, that's for sure. This happened a few years back when I worked at Starbucks. I was the opening supervisor and our store was in kind of a rough area, I guess. I always tried to arrive a little early and this day was no different. I pulled in before my coworker had gotten there, but in the otherwise empty parking lot was a truck parked sideways across three spots. The truck is facing the parking lot exit. Already wary, it's around 4.15 in the morning and there were no working streetlights in the lot. I kept my doors locked and stayed in my car. Not a minute later, a man gets out of the truck and walks up to my car, knocks on my window. I crack the window an inch and he starts telling me about how he has to get to the airport and he's in a hurry but his truck needs a push to start. He tells me specifically, I just need you to come and push from my door. I'll be in the driver's seat and you'll give me the momentum that I need. I don't know anything about cars, but that set off alarms in my head. Not to mention if his car is having trouble. Our airport was like really far away and only accessible by freeways. Not an easy trip for a struggling vehicle by any means. I tell him that I'll be happy to push the truck from behind once my co-worker arrives, but I refuse to do that before then. And with that, he immediately blows up. He screams and calls me all sorts of names and then just storms off back to his truck. He starts the truck up and speeds out of the parking lot. I never had anything come of it, but I'm still pretty sure that I foiled some sort of malicious plan from that guy. I'm grateful that I'm enough of a morning person to be thinking clearly that early because if I hadn't been, I don't know what would have happened. This happened about 16 years ago when I was exactly 14 years old. Some parts are a little blurry and I apologize in advance for that, but I've got most of the story in memory. So it was summertime and as always, my mother and her best friend had decided to rent a house in the south, close to the beach, so we could all enjoy the summer holidays together. They had found this really nice house right next to the beach with a garden and enough space for all of us to fit. My mother's friend had her two sons, one who was 15 years old and came with his best friend, and then the younger brother who was 11 at that time. The neighborhood, from what I can remember, was quiet, mostly safe and surrounded by woods. But we didn't pay attention at that time as we were mainly spending our time on the beach, surfing and enjoying freedom. For me, it was a relief to be miles away from my hometown, to be honest. I'd had a very rough year facing school harassment that could have costed my life, Fortunately, my mother fought for me and changed me out of the school to finally bring some peace to my tormented mind. My bullies, they had posted online my phone number, making me receive calls from unknown people, mostly men. 
and this will play an important role at the end of the story. So those holidays were an opportunity for me to just breathe, to disconnect from reality and just enjoy my time. But something very weird happened, something that 16 years later I still try to think about. What would have happened to me if I had done this? You see, it started one afternoon. My phone buzzed with a text message. I thought at first it was my best friend telling me about her holidays. But we were all relaxing before going out to the restaurant later. I was sitting on the couch and playing Mario Kart with the boys, but the message was from an unknown number and said the following. Oh honey, my heart only beats for you. I only think about you every day and every night. To be honest, at first, I thought it was just a wrong number. I simply replied with a polite message stating that it's probably a wrong number. As no one replied back to, I just let it go and kept playing on my Mario Kart session with my 11-year-old friends. Around 5.50pm, I'd say, while everybody was getting ready for the restaurant, I received another text message that really intrigued me. It said, at 6pm, go out of your house alone and follow the arrows made out of sand. I'll wait for you at the end. I was now extremely confused and I didn't know what to do, to be honest. I replied and asked who was sending me these messages, but again, no reply. At 6pm though, I walked out of the house just to take a peek out of the gate and see if there were actually really any sandy arrows, and yeah... They were there. Now, thinking back about this event, I realized that I was really reckless with what I did next. But as a 14-year-old teenager, hopelessly romantic and dreaming of having a very summer love experience, I thought that I would let my curiosity win this time. Now that I think about it too, all this time I thought that it was the 15-year-old brother and his best friend who wanted to make a joke about me or something. But the whole afternoon they were there with us, so I have no clue who may have done this to be honest. In any case though, I walked a bit out of the house and tried to follow the arrows that were leading straight into the woods. My intuition made me stop immediately at that. My gut was begging me not to go any further in the woods alone. So I turned around and I walked back to the house and never told anyone about this story. I simply received a text saying, I'm waiting for you, darling, and that was it. But here's where the story gets a little creepy. You see, a few months later, I found out that where we rented the house, a man was being searched for, mostly because he was trying to get in contact with teenagers, and apparently was trying to drag them into the woods for, well, evil intentions. I still don't know if this is all linked to my own story or if it was maybe just a coincidence. Would he have found my phone number on one of those websites that my bullies had given? No clue, but I changed my phone number when I started my scholarship at my new school and I never got harassed again, thankfully. Like I said though, I still think back about all of that and I wonder. This is something that I've been needing to get off my chest for a while now, and I'm not really sure where else to tell it, to be honest. So a few years back, after my junior year of high school, I was working a summer job making enough money where I could support myself for a few days if need be. At the time, my parents decided that they wanted to take a trip to the beach for their anniversary, leaving me home by myself for a week, which was fine by me. And well, the time came and they left, leaving me and my dog to fend for ourselves. I should add context saying that it wasn't uncommon to hear footsteps or things moving on their own as I've lived next to a graveyard all my life and I just sort of took it as a, that's how things were really. Well, about three days had passed since they had left and I had just gotten off of work and the sun had started to go and set and by the time that I got home it was pretty much dark. The first thing that I noticed when I pulled into the driveway though was that I could see light through the window of my living room which I thought was odd but when I walked into my home I quickly realized that 
every single light in my house had been turned off. Not thinking too much of it, I looked through the house and turned them off, only leaving my living room and kitchen light on. But that was when I noticed, too, my dog was not laying in his bed. I found him underneath a cabinet in my bathroom, shaking to the point that I thought that he was sick. But he calmed down and came out after he saw that it was me. Like I said before, a little activity in the house was not uncommon, so I just thought that it was a strange occurrence and sort of shrugged it off. At this point, it's dark outside and had started pouring down rain, but I had to go and pick up dinner from somewhere, so I went and got Sonic, and when I was headed back, I had nearly forgotten about what had just happened, but sure enough, when I pulled back into the driveway, the lights were on again, but... This time when I stepped foot into the house, I was hit by this just overwhelming stench. A smell so foul and pungent that it honestly made my eyes water immediately. That should have been my telltale sign to tuck tail and run as soon as I got there, but I didn't. I sat my food on the counter by the door and went to find my dog, who was laying in the corner of the living room, seemingly stressed to the point that he had puked on the floor. I quickly got him on his chain and out of the house and got to cleaning up the mess. At this point and time, the smell had only gotten worse too and had this terrible feeling of fear that I can't even describe. I finished cleaning the mess though and realized that I should probably turn the lights off so I started in the bathroom, into my father's room and then into my room. Nothing eventful happened during this but when I got to my mum's room... I could feel something just staring at me from behind, but when I looked back there, of course there was nothing there. In the end, I got out of there without turning the lights off, and when I was walking back up the hallway, I felt it again, but this time when I turned around, I saw something. This awful decayed or burnt looking thing was standing right where I'd come in from the middle of the hallway right outside of my mother's room. I froze in fear and just stared directly back at him. His eyes were almost human too but way too sunken back and I could see the sort of dark charred skin hanging from his face. I have no idea how long it stayed like this, but eventually, I tore myself back, and when I looked back over there, the thing was gone. And the lights in my mother's room had turned off. I remember just sitting on the floor after that in tears, just staring at the spot where this thing was. I must have sat there for about ten minutes at least before... Finally, getting my nerve together and sprinting out of my house, grabbing my dog and just staying in my truck the entire night. By the time that we had went back in, the sun had come back up and things seemed to be back to normal. I never really mentioned this to anyone and I probably wouldn't have, but I saw it again yesterday at a quick glance while doing the dishes. It was standing just a few meters away from me behind the table, but it was gone as soon as I blinked. From everything that I've researched too, this sounds demonic and the activity in the house has increasingly picked up since that day. If you're listening to this and have some sort of knowledge about the paranormal or demonic, then please do let me know if this sounds like that. Also, if you have any advice on what I can do to get rid of it... That would be much appreciated. I was a lead bartender in a pool hall in the outskirts of New Orleans for about 10 years. Our main patrons, they were older men who mostly lived alone. But we were the spot that they sort of came to socialize. The many came for long hours every day, whether they played pool that particular day or not. Over the years, many of these men passed, a few men dying in the building. We had a few fatal heart attacks and a stroke victim who passed before the EMTs could get there. Sadly, this bar was the last place many of these men had felt happy and needed in their lives, which I think may have drew some of them back after passing. Also, 
Bars have long been rumoured to be favourite hangouts for earthbound spirits who don't realise that they're dead and are craving one more drink or smoke, or possibly game of pool in this case. And with that said, there was definite activity in the bar or pool hall, though it was a bit on and off. A male voice would loudly say my name, directly in my ear with a blast of warm air, as if it had breath when I was nowhere near any living person. At the beginning of my shift, the bar was usually empty, so I would go into the office to count the money in the gaming safe. I always kept the camera feeds up on the monitor, just in case someone came in. I can't tell you how many times I would look at the monitor and see someone just sitting at the bar waiting for service, even though I hadn't heard the door chime. I would head out to the bar only to find it empty. Most often it was a really pale white guy with dark hair, white tee, black jacket. And one day, my first customer of the shift came in and sat in the seat that the pasty guy had been in on the camera feed about maybe an hour or two before. I didn't say anything, not wanting to sound crazy. I was behind the bar and about 10 feet from the customer when he screamed like a little girl and jumped up so fast that he sent his chair flying backwards. He swore up and down too that someone had just grabbed his leg and squeezed. He said that he could feel the individual fingers and everything. We were the only two people in the bar though and he left immediately, still shaking. I saw people in my peripheral that weren't there too when I turned towards them. Many times I would be serving drinks and call out, I'll be right with you as soon as I finish here, before turning to see no one. I thought it might just be me seeing things, but it literally never happened anywhere else except at work. And several times, customers remarked that they could have sworn that they had seen someone who had just been standing there as well. Now, to get behind the bar, you had to go to the end farthest from the entrance, where a section of the bar lifted up like a door. To the right was where the bartending happened, but to the left there was a hallway that had the office and rooms with the safers, extra liquor bottles, stuff like that. Basically, everything down that hallway had a lot of value and the bartenders were expected to make sure that no one came behind the bar or gained access to the hallway. But I always saw people walking back there. Not from my peripheral either. These people looked very solid and real. I could easily describe their skin and hair color even. Outfits, the whole shebang. I would go running back there, check all of the three rooms down the hallway panicking and eventually not find a soul, even though the only way out would have been to pass me. Let me just say too that this happened all the time, whether I was slow or busy. It actually seemed to happen more when the bar was packed, in fact. My regulars were very familiar with this routine too and teased me about it unmercifully. However, word of this did cause my co-workers to begin sharing their own experiences with me, so... I was able to get some confirmation that at least that I wasn't going crazy. The activity, which had always been intermittent too, got really intense for almost two months at one point. And then, everything just sort of stopped. For months. The guy who got his leg grabbed and a few other regulars who had witnessed some things commented on it too. So did my co-workers. And no more chasing shadows or disappearing customers... To be honest, it was sort of great, really. A few months after the activity stopped at the bar, though, I'm taking a shower at home. It's a stand-up shower, no tub. I noticed that the far right corner of my shower seemed very dim, though. I peeked my head out to make sure that none of the other three bathroom bulbs had burned out or something. They were all shining away, and I just sort of shrugged it off even though I definitely had a slightly unsettling feeling. It was nothing major though, and I just continued for several weeks like this. Although, not every day it would happen, and the feeling of unease grew. It wasn't always dim over there, but when it was, I swear that I could feel it before even looking. The shower is my happy place, and I hated this newfound creepiness invading it. I tried to think of every possible explanation too. Seasonal changing of the angle of sunlight, weather or cloud conditions, my mental state. I mean, you name it, I thought of it. However, 
I had lived there for over five years at this point and had never seen anything remotely like this. I have one tiny bathroom window with thickly frosted glass and a screen so it's never really affected the lighting in the bathroom in any way and it's angled away from the shower anyway so how the heck was this happening? Weirdly too, as time went on, the dimness grew more pronounced. It now looked more like a diffused shadowy mist than a dim spot. The feeling of unease, it began to change too. I started feeling like something was watching me while I showered. I found myself refusing to close my eyes or turn around when showering and seriously considered how long I could go between showers before it became, well, noticeable. I had been trying to convince myself that it was all some kind of stress-induced psychosomatic weird thing that my brain was doing or a strange type of vision anomaly or something, but I was completely unsuccessful. I finally accepted that there was actually something there watching me at my most vulnerable point, and enough was enough. I contacted a friend and told him a little bit about what I'd felt, and expressed my desire to do a house cleansing. I didn't want to do it alone, and he agreed to come over in two days. Feeling better about the whole situation now, I had a slightly smug air as I started my shower that night. Lo and behold, there was no darkness no shadows no weird feelings it was great too maybe maybe I had been tripping after all so to speak I'm under the water though with my eyes closed enjoying the heck out of my bright peaceful shower when a shock of alarm just jolted through me it felt like someone was standing right there in front of me and staring at me hard when I opened my eyes the shadow it was there and looked different than ever before. It was much darker. There was clearly visible sort of oval egg shaped center of deeper darkness in the middle of the shadows, although I could still see through it. The top of it was slightly lower than my upper chest, I'm just under five foot, and it didn't have hard edges at all, just kind of diffused out to lighter shadow if that makes sense. The oval was roughly three feet from top to bottom and about a foot and a half wide. And I just stood frozen, staring at it for a few seconds. It was like my brain was having trouble processing what I was seeing. Then my brain started working again and I jumped out of the shower, stark naked and half rinsed, ran through the house, dripping shampoo and water everywhere, yelling, what the heck, over and over. I'll admit that it's pretty hilarious to picture it now, but at the time, I was scared out of my mind. I skipped my shower the next day, obviously, and when my friend arrived the day after, I frantically filled him in on what had happened the night that we agreed to do the cleansing, although I did leave out the part about running around naked and yelling. He had this little smirk on his face, so I asked him if he believed me. Oh, I believe you. I believe that you saw something. Slightly patronizing, but understandable given the situation, I guess. Besides, I thought having a skeptic on hand could be a, a good thing, maybe. So I started burning herbs on charcoal and calling in protection. We began in the living room, and as soon as I called for protection, my friend jumped and gasped, eyes popping out of his face. He took a few steps back and sat on the couch. He was very pale all of a sudden and had his ankles tightly crossed and his hands clasped firmly in his lap, elbows tucked in, sitting very straight. Although he didn't know this, he had automatically assumed a pose recommended to close off your energy or aura, for those of you who know about that. The poor guy though just looked horrified. He claimed that as soon as I called out for protection, a bone-chilling blast of frigid air went straight through his entire body. I was standing right in front of him at the time and he was amazed that I didn't feel anything. He was completely freaked out though and I convinced him that finishing the cleansing was important after experiencing something like that. So he bravely got up and he began helping me cleanse my place. After we were through I decided to let the herbs finish burning out in the shower. When I went to the shower which we had just spent a lot of time in smoking it out with herbs there was a single black fat fly laying dead on its back right in the corner that the shadow liked to hang out in. 
We were both absolutely certain that it wasn't there a few minutes before. While I realize that flies get into houses, obviously, the timing and the placement was really freaky. Like, we had just seen this and then it was there. I've been here seven or eight years now too, and that was the first, last, and only time that I've ever found one of those big black corpse flies in my apartment like that too. Thankfully, I haven't had any issues with shadows in my shower since. To this day, my friend gets noticeably freaked out when I bring up the cleansing, so I like to do it when we're drinking, and his expressions are even funnier than usual. But... I don't think it was a shadow person or a demon or anything like that. I think it was a ghost without the energy to fully manifest, but who still liked to peep on 20-something females while they were showering. I never saw or felt it anywhere or any time else while it was in my place. I honestly think that whatever it was, though, it was perverted. I also think that it most likely was that pasty guy who liked to mess with me at work just eventually following me home. But to be honest, who knows? He's long gone now, but probably lurking in the corner of some other poor woman's shower.